right, how's it going everyone? Hope you guys are having a good day. And today we are building a PC, something I've waited almost two years to do again because of, well, you know. We're gonna be covering the basics to ensure this process goes smoothly within your build, whether you're using the exact same parts or similar parts that you have in mind. Rest assured, we'll go through everything step by step and make sure we make the process nice and simple. And if you have any questions or need any assistance, feel free to comment down below and I'll do my best to help you out. Also, if you're just along for the ride of kicking back, chilling, and watching a build, that's awesome too. Either way, thanks for your time, and let's knock this out. Now we're trying to aim at the $1,200 to $1,300 budget here because prices do like to jump up and down a bit. So this is kind of the ballpark we've landed with as of now, and these are the parts we're going with. And of course, everything we're working with will be listed down in the description below with some alternatives in case you wanna swap anything out. So starting with our motherboard of choice, we're gonna be using the N7 B550 from NZXT, which looks like an absolute spaceship of a board. It's got a clean, functional design, free from any gamer branding. And depending on the pricing of this board at the time, you can jump to another similar alternative and save some cash with ASUS's X570 Plus. Now moving on to CPU, we're working with the Ryzen 5 5600X, which right now at under 200 bucks is still an awesome chip to drive. Whether you're throwing productivity-based tasks or focusing on gaming performance, you won't be disappointed. All right, so storage. We've got an M.2 NVMe drive from Western Digital, which at this point should definitely be on your radar if you're looking into building a new PC. It's simple to install, lightning fast, and keeps your cable management to a minimum without breaking the bank. Also, it happens to be a really simple install, starting with popping off the M.2 cover plate, which is held in magnetically, and you're also gonna wanna find this little screw inside your motherboard box that will secure your drive to the board. Slot the drive in at an angle and push down the opposite side so it sits flush with the mount. Try not to over-tighten any of the screws in the build, just get them snug enough to where they feel like they're gonna hold. After we're done with that, pop the cover back into place and we're good to move on. If you happen to have any additional drives you're planning on adding, just repeat the same steps as before and you'll be good to go. Now the more precise part of every build comes with installing our CPU into the motherboard CPU socket. You definitely don't wanna spill or drop anything during this stage of the build. Before we bring out our processor, I'd like to take a closer look at where we'll be installing it. You'll notice this little lever on the side of the socket that we can easily push out so it unlatches and then push up the rest of the way. So now we can take our CPU and look for a little mini triangle that will actually indicate where we'll need to line it up for the install. In this case, it happens to be on the bottom left-hand corner of the chip. And on the socket, it happens to be on the upper left-hand corner. Align these two triangles and slowly place it into the socket without adding any unnecessary force. It should just slot in, and if not immediately, just give it a little nudge to ensure it's fully in. Go ahead and pull down the same lever from before. Even if you feel a bit of resistance, it's completely normal. You can clip it back into place and you're done. That's pretty much one of the more nerve wracking experiences for new builders, and it wasn't that bad, right? And I've got even better news for you. The next step happens to be even easier. Continuing with RAM now, we've gone with a set of Corsair Vengeance Pro sticks that should pair great with the build. Now installing these involves popping these little tabs on the DIMM slots. Some motherboards have the tabs on both top and bottom, but in this case, we only have them on the top. Pop the second and fourth slot open and line up the notch on the memory module with the notch on the slot. Slide it into the rails, pushing firmly with equal pressure until you hear two clicks or you feel it pop into place. You'll notice the two tabs will lock back into place and then we can move on to installing our CPU cooler. For this, we're going pretty simple with the stock Ryzen Wraith cooler. I would recommend looking into a possible upgrade in the future, like a beefier air cooling solution or even the liquid cooling route. But for now, let's install the essentially free stock cooler, which will be fine for the 5600X. So the factory mounting brackets do need to be removed in order to install our cooler. There's four screws here holding the back plate, and once you remove them, the plate will become loose once you fully remove the screws. It's also a good idea in case you're using a different universal cooler to ensure you're getting the correct mounting hardware for the specific socket you're working with. The included user manuals usually cover the proper brackets and spacers you need to make sure you're getting perfect even mounting pressure. In this case, this cooler fits natively with AM4 sockets and mounts fairly easy. 
The stock heatsink does come with pre-installed thermal paste that you'll want to avoid touching or accidentally placing down on a surface. So you also won't need to worry about adding any additional thermal paste with this build and lining up this cooler with the mounting brackets is pretty easy. You have two options in terms of orientation for wherever you'd like the logo and cable to feed from. Before I tighten this down, I like to have an idea of where my CPU fan header is located on the board and where my cable will look cleanest routed through. Once you're happy with that orientation, place the cooler down on the anchor points and begin to tighten the first spring-loaded screw until you feel it grab the threading on the back plate. And then switch over to the screw located diagonally and repeat the same process for all the screws going little by little. You just want to make sure you're getting even mounting pressure and spreading the thermal compound evenly as it compresses between the cooler heat sink and the heat spreader on the CPU. Once you're tightened down and plugged in, we can move on to some case prep. So we've gone with the NZXT H510 for this build. It's a pretty simple muted white case. It's not an airflow monster by any means. It doesn't have a billion RGB lights, but it looks clean and goes with the aesthetic for under hundred bucks. You could also pick up the flow version if you want the mesh front, but that's up to you. Pick whichever case you want. Same goes with fan orientation. If you're installing more fans, make sure you have a proper flow of air throughout your system so you can optimize airflow in and exhaust it out. But since we're staying simple and going with the factory fans, we're not really gonna need to worry about this. Now on the back of the case, we can start by taking this panel off and dealing with this bundle of cables coming out here. These cables connect your front IO, so it's your power button, USB ports, and audio jack on the case to your motherboard. We don't really need to deal with them just yet, but first install our motherboard into the case. Just put aside the included accessory box and locate the 6-32 screw bag that's gonna be used for mounting the motherboard. All right, once you've got that aside, flip the case and pick up your motherboard. Some motherboards will not have a pre-installed IO shield, so just make sure you've got that installed before you try to place it in the case. So start with lowering the board slowly while angling it toward the back of the case. So you get a snug fit with the IO shield and assure that it's sitting on top of the standoffs. You might need to adjust it a bit to accommodate for the fan wires and ensure it's sitting where we want. Next, we can start with securing it down to the seven mounting points with the screws we put aside earlier. Now make sure to tighten these enough where the board is gonna be snugly mounted, but not to the point where you're gonna crack the board. Keep it even, don't stress it out. Okay, so before we move on to our power supply install, knocking out the case wiring first does create a lot less clutter for the future, so we can start with that now. Before we plug anything in, we're gonna check back to the bundle of case cables from earlier and free up the individual cables. The first cables we can grab are the HD audio and front panel connectors. Usually routing these through the bottom of the case is the best bet with this specific board having the audio on the left and panel connections on the right. Just make sure you've got these connectors in the right orientation so the pins will line up. And this is definitely the most boring part of the build, but it's still a necessity to ensure your system will fully function and won't leave you with a headache at the end. Now for the other two connectors, you'll find the front panel USB-C connector towards the center right of the board, and the USB 3.0 connector is actually on the side of the motherboard toward the bottom. So you can route both these cables through the middle portion of the case and plug them in firmly. The last two cables coming from the case that need to be plugged in are our fan connectors, which also need to be plugged in at the bottom of the motherboard and can be routed through the same bottom portion we use for the first two connectors. Plug these into system fan one and system fan two. Okay, so take a breather now and let's move on to the power supply setup. We went with an EVGA 700 watt, nothing crazy, gets the job done and it's reliable. So since it's not fully modular, we do have to deal with a bunch of cables that we're gonna need to separate and then figure out the ones we actually need. But we also picked up some custom sleeved extension cables for about 25 bucks that are really gonna clean up the look of the build without complicating anything. So the stock cables will stay hidden while the extensions will actually show. Before we can slide the power supply into the bottom of the case, there's a three and a half inch drive cage that we aren't gonna be using. So we're just gonna remove that and clear some space down there. It's pretty simple to remove. Just unscrew the four screws on the bottom and you're good to go. Now, when you install the power supply, you can install it with the fan facing down. That way it'll pull in cool air from the bottom and not hot air from inside the case. So you don't have to overcomplicate or overthink this. A lot of these power supply fans won't even kick on until they've exceeded a certain threshold. Now, if you are restricting the airflow, let's say resting the tower on a carpeted floor, then orientation might be something to think about. All right, once you've figured that out, you can screw in the power supply using the included case screws, and now we can finalize the cables. I promise we're almost done and finally reaching the end where we can launch it all up. Now, it may look pretty overwhelming having all these cables everywhere, but we're gonna pick out exactly what we need. Starting with the largest cable, and that happens to be the motherboard's 24-pin power, which can be routed through the main cable management gap 
and clips into the port. Before we do this, I'm gonna clip in the gray and black extension, which just plugs into the female end, and then route that through the middle and out to the front where we can plug it in. Next is our CPU 8-pin cable that can be routed towards the upper right-hand side and should come out right next to the plugs. The cable slots into the 4-pin slot on the top left-hand side of the board, and in some high-end motherboards, you may find yourself using the additional connector. Once you've plugged that in, you're good to move on. Now we can finally route our GPU power connectors, which happen to use both 8-pin PCIe connectors. Plug in your extensions, if you happen to have them, and run these cables through the main gap from before, so the cables come out through the front. Just try to make sure you keep all the runs nice, use the included cable combs, zip ties, make everything nice and organized, so you don't have spaghetti and meatballs going on down there. It might be a good idea double checking all the connections from before, making sure you have everything plugged in correctly. The 24 pin motherboard power, eight pin CPU, and now the PCIe cables. So the final step of building the system is installing the GPU, which happens to be, in my opinion, the best part of any build, because we are right at the finish line of building this awesome PC. We do have to clear out some of these PCI expansion slots to make room for the graphics card, so just unscrew these two screws here and slide the cover out of the way. And then use a little bit extra force getting off the second and third brackets. We can then locate the top PCIe slot, which is where we're gonna end up plugging the graphics card into. So slowly lower and line up your GPU with the slot on the motherboard, making sure you have enough clearance near the bracket and apply firm, even pressure to slot it in. Make sure you feel it slot in, and then you can secure the bracket screws on the mount that we removed before the install. Lower the cover and make sure to retighten the screws. And then you can plug in your GPU power cables, just like you've done with all the other cables. Make sure before you try to test run the system that you ensure everything is plugged in correctly and that your power supply switch is actually on, just in case you need to troubleshoot something before making all the cables all neat and pretty. Once you've done that, we can go ahead and try hitting the power button. If you actually have your computer boot to the BIOS, then you've pretty much gone through the entire guide and congrats, you've got yourself a pretty good looking system that not only looks nice, but performs pretty well. Like I've mentioned before, all the parts we used are linked in the description as well as some alternatives should you wanna check something like this out. But yeah, I think this came out really sick. There's not a ton of RGB, but it's pretty compact and you've got room to change things up in the future if you'd like. But man, I'm really digging the whole simplicity of the build. So let's also mention a couple other things you definitely wanna do after finishing the build, like updating your drivers and BIOS to their latest version. You can update the BIOS simply by using a USB flash drive and going to your motherboard manufacturer's website and looking for the current up-to-date version and then booting back into the BIOS by spamming the delete key upon restarting the PC. We're also gonna to need to install Windows 11 now, as well as updating your motherboard, chipset, and GPU drivers, all that fun stuff. We then wanna make sure our RAM is running at its native speed by enabling XMP in the BIOS, and then I like to install a program called Ninite for bundling all your installers into one download and keeping the system clutter-free. And that's pretty much it. We could go way more into detail for some future builds, but I think that covers most of the basics without going too deep into everything. So thank you so much for your time. Don't be a stranger, drop a comment and a like if you liked the video and sub if you wanna see more of this kind of stuff. So thanks for watching as always, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.